Growth hormone. Is this the pro bodybuilder secret to hypertrophy or is it just a tool within our tool belt to use as coaches? So today we're going to kind of break down some aspects that you need to understand of what is the coach's role within stack design, potentially using growth hormone. What are some of the benefits to actual growth hormone usage? And then kind of how does this apply from an experience standpoint within the coaching realm in order for you to be able to utilize this with the clients, some of the pitfalls you might run into and, and really just use it within the right use case scenario. Uh, as it's going to be a valuable tool in our tool belt and we just need to understand its role within stack design. So what is the coach's role? The coach's role is to pull the most out of the least. This is going to go for matching the client's need in order to progress their physique to the next level relative to the risk profile that they're willing to take and making sure that we make decisions that align with that. Now, where, where growth hormone fits into this equation is potentially pulling the most out of the least by creating synergies with a different pathway other than the androgen receptor in order to pull more out of the athlete before having to escalate androgen load to the next level within the risk profiles of their competitive journey. In the past, growth hormone has been viewed as something that you have to earn the right to use. You don't get to use it until you turn pro or we have to be competing uh, on the national level, almost winning pro cars. And it's kind of like that that next step as a bodybuilder or a physique athlete. And I would tend to, to make the argument that, it, that it's not. Being non-androgenic, uh, we're going to see quite a bit less health detriment from growth hormone usage in regards to some of the side effects that we do see with super physiological androgen use. And so it would potentially have use case a little bit earlier in someone's process in order to limit the escalation of androgen load and getting the most out of the least. So obviously growth hormone implementation is about maximizing the response through the growth hormone to IGF-1 axis and making sure that we gain the hypertrophy benefits that growth hormone and IGF-1 can provide. Now, we know growth hormone is going to have a couple different roles, but one of the big ones is a primer for fat loss. It's going to have a role in increasing lipolysis within adipose tissue. It's going to have an impact on beta oxidation within skeletal muscle, and it's going to contribute to actual HDL production and uptake within the liver. Now, this is one of the, the nice things that growth hormone kind of throughout the contest prep is going to provide. Obviously, we'll be dropping it out on the back end of contest preps because of the potential fluid retention that comes along with growth hormone usage. But it's going to be a great tool within the fat loss perspective. Now, growth hormone usage in and of itself within maximizing hypertrophy outcomes within an off-season setting is more about the IGF-1 expression that occurs from exogenous growth hormone administration. Now, in the past, we've obviously discussed things around like local IGF-1 and using more frequent administrations in order to elevate local IGF-1. And ultimately, it's going to be about making sure that that growth hormone can convert into IGF-1, which we discussed really in depth within level one throughout the PED module and ensuring that we have all the surrounding environment to maximize that growth hormone to IGF-1 conversion. Because ultimately, IGF-1 is gonna be the transporter of nutrients if you wanna think of it in the IGF-1 for dummies context. Now, not only are we gonna gain the benefits of growth hormone to IGF-1, there's obviously synergies with growth hormone usage that we dive in depth to about like why we have these synergies with growth hormone and testosterone, growth hormone and insulin, how those synergies work and where you see these actually work together to create better outcomes. The base of most stack designs is always going to be test. It's the bioidentical hormone that we're using as the baseline for, it's the bioidentical hormone that we're using for the baseline hormonal environment. And it's going to be used as a part of the super physiological escalation. And that presence of testosterone and conversion into estradiol, so the aromatization into estradiol, is going to have a large synergy with growth hormone implementation. Now, we also will see a synergy between growth hormone and insulin, and we dive into that really in depth within level one, uh, but this is essentially going to be like Willy Wonka's golden ticket, and the, the usage of growth hormone having these synergies, pulling the most out of growth hormone to IGF-1 axis in order to elicit hypertrophy through a pathway that is different than the androgen receptor is going to make it a really good candidate for most people outside of those with medical conditions that are contraindicated for growth hormone use. And so this is where if we look at the average healthy male or the average healthy female that is going into super physiological escalations to pursue physique development, growth hormones should certainly be on the table as a viable option very early on in the process. 
Now, the reality of coaching is there are certainly some things to consider about what clients can we use this with, to what level can we use this with, and can we actually pull the most out of growth hormone within the clients that we work with. So the first one to consider is budget considerations. Uh, Growth hormone is not cheap, and it's not going to be something that is overly budget friendly. So it does need to be considered that it is going to be taking away from the overall budget for the month. And this would need to be weighed alongside all the other compounds and health testing that is going to be needed in order to manage the long-term client's outcomes. Now, assuming we have affordability for this, we also need to ensure that we've got prophylactic strategies and and metric tracking in order to manage some of the potential negative adaptations from growth hormone. The primary one that's typically brought up is blood glucose elevation with growth hormone usage. This is where a basal insulin becomes really, really useful within all season settings that use growth hormone. And it is certainly something that, again, would need to be worked to the budget as a part of growth hormone usage, as over time, you will see that need for potential insulin deployment in order to manage insulin sensitivity within the client and make sure that we pull the most out of their process. And the third one is going to be access to real growth hormone, whether it's jumping through the hoops for the prescriptions or wondering if your black market growth hormone is actually real. I've certainly seen growth hormone fate for many other things. In fact, a client having fate growth hormone with melanotan. Uh, so you can imagine how shocked he was to wake up like seven shades darker after a few days of, of usage. Um, but this is a big problem. And this is something that certainly would suggest that we need some sort of testing in order to ensure amino acid sequence um, is identical to, to what would be needed for growth hormone and the amount of IUs that you're getting within your pins or within your kits are going to match the amount that is actually kind of listed on on those. So the access to actual growth hormone is going to contribute to whether you should be using this as well. Uh, But this would kind of go along typically with the budget considerations of making sure that the growth hormone is real. Now, the last one would be obviously people want to talk about ceiling dose of growth hormone and, and seeing usage up in the 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 IUs per day. And uh, for a lot of people, this is going to be where they need to be for their risk profile and progressing their physique up. Now, there is always the consideration within a contest prep for people who are pretty responsive to the fluid retention sides of growth hormone is that is this going to actually affect our ability as coaches to assess where they're at from a body composition perspective? This would be clients who have large shifts in visuals with growth hormone implementation or growth hormone dropping out. Um, This certainly is something that can start to blur the lines of how fast your rate of loss is actually progressing that client. And it is something to consider within what that stack design looks like within a contest prep. Now, we had already mentioned that it does have a role in fat loss, so it is a very good compound to use within stack designs of contest preps, but do consider that the accuracy of the assessment could be skewed if you didn't have it in previously kind of heading into the prep from the all season phase. Now, the last question is, is it absolutely mandatory or necessary? And, and the reality of it is, is no, it's not. There's certainly been plenty of physique athletes who have done very well without growth hormone usage. I will say when you start to get to the upper echelons of the sport, it does become pretty hard to compete without trying to get every little bit out of your process, doing those 1% type things where growth hormone would typically need to come in in those cases in order to pull the most out of an athlete, ensure that we're influencing progress through that growth hormone IGF-1 pathway and really kind of just using all the levers that we have available for an athlete to progress. But there's certainly been athletes that I've won pro cards with that haven't touched growth hormone once. And so there there is a possibility to progress up without it, especially if budgetary considerations don't allow for it, access is an issue or whatever it may be. Doesn't deter you from progressing as a bodybuilder. It's just a very powerful level or a very good lever to pull within athletes when you can. Now, just some general recommendations uh, is typically for, for most athletes starting around two to three IUs, do typically see ceiling dose around eight IUs uh, in order to kind of get the most out of the growth hormone. Um, from a coaching takeaways perspective, really, it's just ensuring that you have an accurate understanding of how this growth hormone implementation influences an individual's physique presentation. There's going to be some people who the fluid retentive aspects of growth hormone usage are going to need to be dropped out on the back end of prep in order to actually get an accurate visual for being 100% contest ready on show day. 
On the flip side, there's certainly people who are going to need it to stay in all the way through the contest prep for the fullness that it provides in order to make sure that they, they come in full enough to present the skeletal muscle tissue that they carry on their frame. So accuracy and assessment's a big part of the coaching takeaways here in order to ensure that you're making the right decisions with their process. But at the end of the day, as long as they aren't medically contraindicated for exogenous growth hormone usage, it fits within the budget of the athlete. We have access to real growth hormone and we're wanting to pull the most out of the lease. It would certainly fit within the majority of stack designs within athletes that you work with in order to build the best physique to win more shows year after year.